and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And his disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. There's that amazement. They were kind of amazed at that. But Jesus said to them, All cannot accept this same, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. And the disciples responded back, Well, look, if we can't divorce our wives for any reason, then why even marry? You know? Believe it or not, there are plenty of people, both within this body and outside of this body, who have the same question. If we can't divorce for any reason, then why even marry? And I want to end, I'm going to get into that question in just a minute, but before that, I want, to, I want to point something out to you here. Notice how Jesus brought it back to the point that we kind of talked about last week, that if you're not married, you're to, you're to, to not be sexually intimate with anybody. Celibacy. He brought it back to that point. He's talking about celibacy when he's talking about the eunuchs in there. Not having sexual relations with anybody until it is between you and your spouse. One man, one woman. Within the confines of biblical marriage. He brought it back to that point. But the other thing I want you to, to look on that is that there's, it's, a, it's a common view today, which is one of the reasons so many couples are living together outside of marriage. Because they, don't want, to, they want the um, benefits of the sexual, physical, emotional bonding, but they don't want to go through all the legal problems of divorce. And so they'd rather just live together. Which in and of itself is, is contradictory thought, because in essence what it's saying is that I'm going to stay with you as long as you make me happy, but as soon as I'm done being happy with you, I'm moving on. That's why God's word says that those who live together, those who are living outside of the bonds of marriage and, and all, doing all these things, they're literally robbing each other. They're taking advantage of one another. 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about that. One, verses 1 through 8. And, and I want to read the whole thing on this because there's a couple things in there that we're going to refer back to in just a few minutes here. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know that what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles, non-believers, and this is what the, basically is how that's used, who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of, avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness therefore he who rejects this does not reject man but God who has given us his Holy Spirit see the Bible makes it very clear as we talked about a little bit last week is that there's only two reasons that God allows divorce number one is for adultery within the marriage the other one is is that if the unbeliever chooses to leave completely the believer. That's the only two reasons. And for the sake of time, as much as I'd like to get in and talk about those things, we can't. If you've got questions on them, if they're, if they're an issue in your life, if they're concerned, I just encourage you to come and let's talk about it. Let's, let's see what God's Word says together on that. But that's the only two reasons that God allows for divorce. And often we have seen it happen is that, that people have... have accused or claimed or complained or whatever is that it's too restrictive when we hold to God's word as a church when we hold to God's word in this teaching we've gotten comments that's not fair that's not right it's too restrictive it's too legalistic but it's what God's word says and the only option we have is to hold to God's word and often people say have said 
well, we're having trouble in our marriage, so therefore maybe we shouldn't have gotten married. Or I'm not happy in my marriage, so therefore maybe I shouldn't have gotten married, and we should consider a divorce. And the Bible gives a resounding no, that is not the case. Just because you're unhappy in your marriage, just because you're, you're having trouble in your marriage, is not a sign that God wants you to divorce. Because God has not called us to happiness. He's called us to holiness. He's called us to a separated from the world, to be a witness to him, to be a witness for him. And these very things, this very trouble in your life or in your marriage that is happening, God wants to use through the power of the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ to make you holy, to set you apart from the rest of the world. And he wants your marriage. And so... And it's out, of, it's out of that holiness that real joy comes. It's out of that holiness that real peace comes. And so that kind of was an amazing thought to the disciples this morning. And maybe it's amazing to you. I don't know. But that's the first amazement we're going to look at. Verse 13 of chapter 10 of Mark. The second thing we're going to look at this morning is the examples of children. You know, Pastor Tom has, has talked a lot about children's ministry. We've got kids in the service. We've got kids in the back room. It's an important part of this body, children's ministry. And um, some of you might think this morning that I'm a little bit biased in, in teaching on this. Well, it is God's Word, and yes, I am biased. But... <laughs> um, but it's a passion of my heart. It's a passion of this here. And, and, and we're going to see some surprising things that, uh, that the disciples just are amazed at what Jesus says. Verse 13, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Here's these parents. They've heard, the, they've heard Jesus Christ teaching on, on the beauty of marriage and, the, and God's stand on divorce. And so now they're bringing their kids to Jesus because they want him to bless them. And what do these disciples do? No, you can't come here. The rabbi's too busy for you. What are you thinking about? There are more things, important things to do. Don't bother us with your kids. And that's what the disciples were doing. They were, and it says, the Bible says that they don't, not only stopped them, they rebuked them. What are you thinking about? Good grief. Bringing kids to the pastor? How stupid is that? You know? And, um, and then you look at that. And the, and the idea that the disciples had on that was that, well, the rabbi, the teacher, has much more important things to do than to deal with little kids. You know? And um, I honestly believe that that is true today. Not that that we have more important things to do than deal with little kids, but that attitude within people's lives is that there are more important things to do than to deal with children. More, you know, people have often have had, in, in talking to people, in, in asking if they'd be willing to pray about children's ministry and asking them willing to serve, often the attitude is, well, I need to be in service with the adults to grow. That's more important to that I be in adults with the adults than it is to serve in children's ministry. And to be very blunt about it, that's a wrong attitude. Yes, we need fellowship. Yes, within the body, we need to be, we, we encourage all of our teachers, we require everybody who's serving in children's ministry to be in a service once a week, to be here in fellowship. And so, I don't say that to make you feel bad or make you feel guilty. Um, it's a wrong attitude to have. And we're going to see that in a little bit because in verse 14 it says, But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them. This wasn't just a little bit of an annoyance on Jesus. The Bible says he was very indignant about it. He was very bothered about it. So it's one of the, I think it's the only time in Scripture that we see that Jesus was greatly, di, dis, where it says he was greatly displeased with the disciples. I mean, we see other areas where he says, come on, guys, where's your faith? You know, we see other areas like that, but he was greatly displeased. You see, they, um, and so Jesus says, let the little children come unto me. 
Now, some of you might have the King James Version, and it says, suffer the children to come unto me. Now, I want to clarify something on that. It's not like the old man who said, every time kids come, I suffer. Okay? That's not what we're talking about here. But the idea of suffer is send the kids to me. Send them over. Bring them over. Because I want to put my arms around them. I want to bless them. I want them to be part of my life. And so Jesus said, send them to me. And then it says, forbid them not. In other words, don't hinder them. Send them to me and don't do anything for, to them or in front of them or whatever to stop them from coming to me. Jesus loves the kids. Jesus loves the little children. He loves the big children. Okay? He even loves the adult children. Send them to me. Bring them to me. I want them to come. Now, the, the question I think that, you know, I believe that, I believe that every, every passage of Scripture has an application. And I believe that every passage of Scripture has something that we can learn from in our homes, that we can learn from in our lives. And so the question is, parents, what are you doing to bring and to send your kids to Jesus Christ this morning? Is what you're doing hindering them, or is what you're doing bringing them to Jesus? When the issues come in their lives, are you sending them to Jesus Christ? Are you going with them to Jesus Christ together when, those, when the little boy pushes down the little girl at school? Are you bringing them to Jesus on? What does Jesus say on this? Are you bringing them to Jesus when, when you lose your job? Are you going to Jesus in front of them? Are you bringing them to Jesus when, when those trials of life that hit you, are you bringing your kids to Jesus? Are you sending them to Jesus? Are you going with them to Jesus? Or is Jesus just simply a once-a-week thing for you? Is Jesus just something that you do when you're not out boating or when you're not out doing sports or when you're not out doing anything else, then you come and you bring your kids to Jesus. Because I believe this morning that, that as parents, and this applies to every one of us this morning, whether we're parents or not, is that as parents and as adults, our responsibility is to bring and to send our children to Jesus Christ. Because they need to have his arms around them. They need his blessing on their lives. And do you pray for that blessing? Do you pray for that blessing? Do you, do you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to bless your children? To guide them? Protect them? They need dad's blessing upon them. They need mom's blessing upon them. Above all, they need the Father, Almighty God, Father, Abba, Daddy, His blessing upon them. And anything that you're doing to hinder your kids from coming to Jesus Christ needs to be stopped, needs to be thrown away. And you need to keep bringing your kids to Jesus Christ this morning. And I promise you, he will bless you for it. You know, then the next thing we see in verse 15, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does, not come, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Oh, well. There's a fly up here, by the way. I'm not clapping for myself. Uh, <laughs> Who does not, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. That's a pretty strong, pretty strong statement. You know, the idea that Jesus is talking about here, a little child um, simply trusts their parents. A little child doesn't try and be in control because they know ultimately that that their parent weighs a whole lot more than they do. <laughs> They're a lot bigger. You know, they might try and manipulate. They might try and do that, but they, inwardly, they know that the, that the adult is in control, that the parent is in control. A little child just simply trusts their parents to provide for them. A little child um, trusts their parents to save them from danger and to watch out for their safety. A little child will gladly, gladly receive what is given to them. They don't usually ask, well, Mom and Dad, do I have to work for this? Do I have to pay for this milk that you're giving me at lunch? Do I have to pay for this food? They simply receive it. They simply take it gladly. 
their trust, a little child, trust in what their mother or their father says. And they simply accept it. And Jesus is saying here, by no, assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means, no other option, it's a double negative, kind of very strong negative, in the sense of there is no other way to enter the kingdom of heaven except like a little child. And there's a huge difference between, be, between being like a little child and being childish. We're not talking about being childish here. We're talking about receiving like a little child. And Jesus says there's no other way, no other options to get in heaven except that way. We've got to give up control of our lives and trust a God, trust a Father in, who, who, in heaven who is so much bigger and so much mightier than us, who has it all, knows everything. The Bible makes it clear that I, God says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for a hope, plans for future. And the, God says that as a, as a little child, we just need to accept that that Jesus Christ, we need to trust Jesus Christ not only to save us, but to take us through anything. We can trust His Word. We can just simply receive what He has done for us on the cross. To receive the blessings that Christ has given us. To, re to repent of our sins. To um, come to Him. And, and the Bible says we can call Him Abba. Call Him Daddy. This is my daddy in heaven. I am so thankful this morning that I have a father in heaven who will take me and forgive me and love me and teach me. And yes, sometimes the teaching hurts. Sometimes the discipline hurts. And we're going to see in a few minutes but there's a purpose on that. But we need to receive Jesus Christ as simply as a little child. And the disciples were amazed at this. Maybe that's a new thought for you this morning. They're amazed at it. Amazement number three. Verses, picking up with verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now, in your Bibles, you might have a, a title in there called The Rich Young Ruler. Now, in this passage here in Mark, we don't see the words young and we don't see the words ruler in there. But it's taken from a couple of different accounts because this is one of the few, few stories, accounts in, in, in the Gospels that happens in three out of the four Gospels. And so it's, it's important that, you know, God has put it there for a reason. And he's given three different accounts. They're all basically the same. But in Luke, we see that this man was a ruler. The Bible doesn't say what kind of ruler he was. The Bible doesn't say if he was in the uh, religious leaders of the day, if he was a, a Greek ruler or a Roman ruler. Um, I would lean towards the fact that he was probably an Israelite ruler of some type because he knew the law. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything on that. The Bible doesn't say. And we also see in Matthew that, um, that this, it says that this young man went away sad. And so that's where, we get, that's where we get the title, The Rich Young Ruler, from these three accounts. Outside of those minor details, the stories are essentially the same. And so here's this guy. He's listening to what Jesus said about marriage and divorce and children. And it's obvious that he doesn't quite just get it about receiving the kingdom as a little child because he runs up to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here it is, this man who um, is he's young, he's wealthy, he's got control over people, he's got power. 
You know, the Bible talks about the three basic categories of sin. It says, um, for all that is in the world, this is taken out of 1 John chapter 2, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And this guy, it was just his, his life was falling into these three basic categories of sin. He had power, he had money, he had wealth, he had control. And so, but yet he knew that he was still hungry, that he was still missing something, that something was still not involved in his life. And so, you know, and, and guys, you think about that. Think about that. Think about anybody that you've heard on the news that has these three things. They've got power, they've got wealth, they've got good looks, they've got money. I mean, just control over people, influence over all kinds of people. And how many stories do we hear of athletes or movie stars or politicians or these people that are out before the public and their lives are crashing down because they're caught up in drugs or caught up in alcohol or they're caught up in sex or they're, or they're um, corrupt in their, in their doings and, you know, this guy is, is often is, is a picture of so many lives today. They have all these things, yet they're still that longing. The Bible says that God has put eternity within the hearts of men. And that eternity longs for that connection with God the Father. That eternity longs within each one of us, longs for that fulfillment that only Jesus Christ can bring. But there's that barrier of sin that separates that. And people find all these things to substitute that. But we're going to see in just a little bit, in a little bit, that it's a matter of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, and we saw that, it says, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? This guy was a moralist. He's trying to earn his way into heaven. He's trying to buy his way into heaven. You know, and I, and I think possibly or probably that this is probably the most common lie within within the church and outside the church. I don't know. I've not done any statistics on it. I don't know for sure. But it's a common thing of this do, do, do. I have to do this for God to like me. I have to do that for God to like me. If I just do more, then God will accept me. If I just do more, then maybe the church will accept me. If I just do, do, do. If I want God's blessing in my life, then I have to do all these things. And that's a lie from the devil. It's not a matter about doing. It's not a matter about doing more. We're going to see a little, in a few minutes what it is, but this whole idea of getting caught up that I have to do more and more and more in order for God to like me more and more and more is a trap. It's a snare. And it's, not going, to, it's going to trap you. Verse 18, Jesus says, So why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know, that's, that's a true statement. There was a common, common statement back in those days that, that no one was really inherently good except God. And that is true. That is a true statement. Now, on, on the surface, this question that Jesus asked this guy is kind of, kind of a, uh, maybe kind of a weird question in your mind or, or something that just doesn't quite make sense. But I believe it goes something like this. Jesus, knowing that, that statement, that out, that out there, that, that um, people are doing, boy, we're just not waiting to get through. We're going to be a few minutes here. Um, knowing that statement, he says this. Either, look, why do you call me good? Either I'm good, which means I'm God, or I'm not good. Okay, you follow me on that? If Jesus Christ was just a good teacher and Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of God and Jesus Christ claimed and he gave his life and he made all these things, if he was not God, then he's a liar. And if he's a liar, he's not a good teacher. So therefore, he has to be God. And he says, why do you call me good? And then I want you to notice this guy here. His response is this, is that I've kept all the commandments. 
I've kept all these things and I've done all these things. Therefore, I'm a good person. And those commandments deal with, look at that, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. They're all dealing with, with the commandments that are dealing in the horizontal relationship. They're dealing with, with this man's response to his fellow man. And evidently it was doing well. Evidently he was doing well. He must have had a good reputation or maybe not. I don't know. But he says just taking it at what we see right here, he evidently treated this fellow man well. And he was a good person according to his standards, not according to God's, because we're going to see that in a little bit here. And Jesus answered, Teacher, verse 20, and he answered and said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up, your, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions." I love how Jesus responds to this guy. The Bible says that he looked at him. The idea is that he looked deep into his soul. He looked deep into his heart. And he discerned what this, one, what this man needed. He says, go, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have. Give your money to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. And follow me. Now, there's so much more I wanted to share with you on that this morning that in there but I'm praying right now what do you want, Lord what do you want me to say I just I love how Jesus Christ discerned the Bible says that the word of God is a discerner of the heart it knows our hearts and if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning praise God that God's word knows your heart because you need it I need it and if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, thank the Lord God that he has given you these things in his word because he does not want you to go to hell. And Jesus looks at this guy and he discerns his heart and he loves him, knowing what's in his heart. He discerns and says, you lack one thing. God often, in a believer will give a spirit of discernment about somebody else, another believer, a non-believer. He'll give you or he'll give me a spirit of discernment. I've had it happen. But that spirit of discernment is not meant or designed or sent to criticize the other person. It is there to intercede for that person to pray for them. And there's a huge difference between a spirit of discernment and a spirit of criticism. And don't let that discernment that God might give you this morning or in the future in somebody's life, you use that to intercede for them and to pray for them and bring them before the throne of God that their lives would be changed. That is how you love them. That's one way of how you love them. And Jesus did that. He discerned him and he loved him. The Bible says the man went away sadly. He went away sadly. Everything that he had worked for, everything he had accomplished, everything he, he controlled in his life. I want to point out just a couple more things here before we have communion this morning. I want you to look at those verse 22. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Sad and sorrowful in the Greek context are two different words. Sad is in the sense of he was very gloomy, very dis disappointed, very discouraged at that. But then it says... He went away sorrowful. The word for sorrowful can also be translated grieving. 
because of the, he was in distress because of the great loss to his life that Jesus was asking him to give up. He was distressed over it, for he had great possessions, acquired a lot. He had control of his life. He had power over people. He had all the possessions that he wanted. He was, treated everybody well. He did all these things. He had a good reputation in town. Yet Jesus said that none of these things mattered. You see, the real issue here wasn't, wasn't him to give up all his possessions, because if it was, that's just another thing to try and earn salvation. The real issue that Jesus is bringing to him here is that who is in control of your life? It's not an issue of giving up possessions. It's an issue of who is in charge. Who are you choosing to follow this morning? That's the real issue that Jesus Christ brought it down. That's why this man fell short of the kingdom of heaven, because he refused to follow Jesus Christ and all that Jesus Christ asked of him. And as far as we know, he did not make it in heaven. We do not know where he is at today. The Bible does not say. But all we know is that he was grieved at the fact that he had to give up control of his life and of everything that he had acquired and trust it, trust his life to a future that he did not know. And it was hard. But Jesus promised him, he says, look, if you do these things, you will have treasure in heaven. And it goes back to that, same, that issue we talked about earlier. He did not consider Jesus Christ to be God Almighty. He only considered him to be a good teacher. And that's the question that needs to be answered in every one of your lives this morning. Jesus Christ, God Almighty, has said it's a matter of lordship. Are you willing to give up whatever is holding you back so that you can follow me for my sake and the sake of the gospel? That's a question that Jesus Christ is asking you this morning, and he's asking me. Well, I can say there's so much more on that, but we're going to have communion here in a few minutes, so kids are going to be coming in. Dying to yourself. Giving your life to Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, just please come talk to us. If there's an issue in your life that you're wondering about, come talk to us.